Okay, I started recording. So, good evening, uh, or well, good afternoon, <laughs> given the way <laughs> our audience. Um, welcome to our second uh, ever Zoom academic talk. Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing Professor Shelley Haley. Uh, Edward North Chair of Classics and Professor of Africana Studies at Hamilton College. She is an expert on Cleopatra and uh, she has discussed the subject on BBC and the Learning Channel programs. Haley was a distinguished visiting scholar at Washington University, St. Louis, and participated in the Oxford Roundtable. She has lectured widely on increasing the representation of students of color in Latin, ancient Greek, and classic classrooms, uh, and on her research about the role of classical education in the lives and careers of 19th century college educated black women. Among her numerous distinctions, her latest uh, is Excellence in Teaching of the Classics at the College Level Award. Uh, awarded by the Society for Classical Studies in 2017. Uh, today, uh, she will be talking about what's a cr critical race feminist like me uh, doing in a field like this. Uh, the talk is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the Society's YouTube channel and Facebook page. So please uh, feel free to turn off your cameras if you're not comfortable with this. Uh, most importantly, uh, Professor Haley's ideas are in the developmental stage, but are still her intellectual property. Uh, therefore, if you wish to use any part of the talk, you are uh, required to cite her. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Shelley Haley. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is the hard part, right? <laughs> um, all right. Can everyone hear me? Just kind of put a thumbs up if you can. Yeah, cool. Um, right. So thank you very much to uh, Elena and the, the, the Durham um, Classical uh, Society for Classical did I get that right? Um, for inviting me. Um, this is only my second uh, Zoom lecture, so I'm hoping it goes okay. Um, if at any time you can't hear me or if something goes wrong, just um, put something in the chat. I don't know if anyone is monitoring the chat, um, but we'll try to get it fixed right away. All right. Um, in my reflections on my location as a black feminist who has evolved further into a critical race feminist who loves teaching uh, Latin and Greek, I owe much to Audre Lorde, especially for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and Zami, to Patricia Williams for the alchemy of race and rights, and to the per personal narratives of Fanny Jackson Coppin and Anna Julia Cooper, who were among the first to combine a classical. I began my love affair with the Latin, the Latin language when I was 14 and attending high school in a small town on the southern tier of New York. It had been originally suggested that I be placed in the non-regents, that is, non-college prep, vocational track with an emphasis on home economics because my grandmother was a cook. The problem was that I was a Haley and the Haley's had lived in Bath, New York since the mid-1800s and although, air quotes, colored, all of them, girls and boys alike, were smart. I had always done well in school and received good grades by 14, I already had had geometry and algebra at my previous school in Virginia. My family had moved first to Philadelphia and then to Virginia when I was nine. We returned to Bath when I was 14, 13. I, I was very depressed to learn that if placed in this track, I could not take any foreign language. My father persuaded, none too gently, 
the guidance department of the injustice of this plan. And so begrudgingly, I was placed in the regent's track for a probationary period to see if I could handle it. Now I face the delightful task of choosing a language. The options were French, German, and Latin. I quickly eliminated German and French because these were conversational languages and I had only recently recovered from my childhood stammer and stutter. I took four years of Latin and excelled. I took the Latin achievement exam and won prizes at the state and national JCL conventions. I continued to take Latin at Syracuse University and started Greek, never intending to major in it. I wanted to be an elementary school teacher, as my students will attest. Um, but always feeling the wonder of these languages spoken so long ago. However, after two weeks in the School of Education at Syracuse, I came back to Latin and declared it as my major. But at Syracuse, I began to wonder if I were the only African American ever to study these languages. There were no other students of color in my classes there. In fact, my peers of color derided my eventual decision to major in Latin. What possible good are you going to accomplish for black people with the languages of dead white people? What indeed? I went to the University of Michigan for graduate work and here encountered the isolation and racism which results when there is not a critical mass of people like oneself in the field. But I persevered, I received my PhD and went off to teach. I am often asked why I went into classics and more importantly, why I have stayed. All I can say is somehow mystically, I suppose, I connected with Latin. Perhaps it was the kindness of my high school Latin teacher. Perhaps it was the orderliness of Latin in a chaotic time in my life. My mother had died when I was 13, puberty had set in, we had moved, and so on. In any case, I continued to teach classics, and elementary Latin remains my favorite, my number one favorite course to teach. I often state that in another life, I was Cicero's mistress. Now, you're all supposed to laugh at that, but I can't hear you. <laughs> What I want to emphasize by giving this personal history is that my training as a classicist has been as traditional and mainstream as it comes. I can analyze the speech of Cicero or explain the complexities of the Roman family structure or give you a point-by-point -point analysis of Herodotus' Herodotus's ethnography. But I have the added consciousness of an African-American woman. No matter how much I immerse myself in the ancient societies of Greece and Rome, I can never escape what it means to be black and female in United States society. That consciousness made me uneasy at some things that I was taught, or rather, at things I was not taught. My experience strongly resembles that of Linda Cardi, an African-Caribbean academic who has described her experiences in the predominantly white academy of the United States and Canada. She begins her essay, quote, uh, Black Women in Academia, a Statement from the Periphery, end quote, in this way, quote, as a black woman from the Caribbean who attended university in this, a white society, a heteros sexual feminist activist, now referred to as an academic because I teach at university, I often reflect on the great gulf which exists between <clears throat> what I knew and know, what I was taught at university, what I actually learned, and what I am now teaching." Unquote. I used to get great delight out of the people's reactions to my specialization until I analyzed the intellectual presupp presupposition of incompetence behind them. The real, that realization came when I was attending an annual meeting of the then 
American Philological Association. I was talking to an official from the National Endowment for the Humanities. He asked me what I did. I told him I taught classics at Howard University. And for those of you who are not from the United States, Howard is a historically black uh, university. His reply, quote, it must be grim teaching classics to black people. It's the only time I came up with the snappy reply you usually think of later. I said, not as grim as sitting here talking to you. End quote, you can laugh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, the assumption, of course, is that black folks are incapable of intellectual pursuits and classics represents the epitome of pure intellectual endeavor. In American history, this assumption, forthrightly expressed by pro-slavery advocates, formed the thesis of arguments against educating Africans in America. John C. Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina, has been alleged to have said that, quote, if there could be found a Negro who could conjugate a Greek verb, I will give up my notions of the inferiority of the Negro, end quote. I always like to point out that John C. Calhoun failed Greek at Yale. This same assumption was the goad that drove black women, especially, to succeed in the white academy. Fanny Jackson Coppin and Anna Julia Cooper cite Calhoun's statement as the impotence to excel at the white gentleman's course, as classics was called, at Oberlin College, notably the first college in the United States to admit men and women, black indigenous people of color and white students together. But that was then, and this is now, scores of African-American women and men have disproved Calhoun's stereotype and moved on to expand the parameters and definition of knowledge. Yet I persist in classics. Why? There is something about classics which inspires a rigid disciplinary loyalty. I suppose it was learning all those declensions and conjugations at a rather young and impressionable age. Over my career, I have certainly felt no loyalty to mainstream classes, which unfortunately include white feminists or the professional organization, the American Philological Association, now the Society for Classical Studies. In fact, in 1994, I resigned from both the APA and the Women's Classical Caucus. There was just too much accommodation to sleaze for my convictions, and it was causing too much preventable stress. The reactions to my departure from the WCC were interesting and highlight the gulf between white liberal academic feminism and black feminism. Obviously, things have changed with the SCS. I eventually rejoined, and here I am today, the president-elect of the organization. I will serve as president in 2021, the first woman of African descent to do so in the 150 plus year history of the organization. But I digress. Why do I persist in classics? I do it because I am a literal, literal radical. I firmly believe that to deconstruct the canon, you have to be radical. That is, you have to know the canon's roots. Transform the roots and you transform the canon. So as a black feminist classicist, I resent the erasure of my academic specialty by the racism of white scholars who assume that I must only know the latest developments in African-American literary criticism, that I have read all the poems of Gwendolyn Brooks, Nikki Giovanni, Audre Lorde, and Sonia Sanchez. In fact, I have, but that's besides the point. <laughs> um, when I interviewed for my current position, one of the interviewers, a white woman in a department affiliated with classics, remarked that if I came to Hamilton, I could teach a course on black women writers 
for the then Africana Studies program. I was peeved. There were, there were many disturbing assumptions behind this suggestion. Perhaps the most annoying is the devaluation of authors who are Black women, right? There is the implication that they do not require years of study and scholarly analysis to teach. Anyone, especially if she is Black and has an advanced degree in one of, some one of the humanities, it doesn't matter, um, can do it. Similar, similarly, many years ago, the directorship of the Africana Studies program at Hamilton was vacant. I learned later that I was one of the candidates considered for the job, but I was never even asked. To understand the resulting tension between who I am, an African-American woman, what I believe, Black feminism, and what I love intellectually, Latin and Greek, I turn to Black feminist thinkers and theorists. From time to time, I reread Patricia Williams' Alchemy of Race and Rights, um, which is published in 1991. Early in her introduction, she writes the following, quote, I am a commercial lawyer as well as a teacher of contract and property law. I am also Black and female a status that one of my former employers described as being, quote, at oxymoronic odds, end quote, with that of a commercial lawyer. While I certainly took issue with that particular characterization, it is true that my attempts to write in my own voice have placed me in a snarl of social tensions and crossed boundaries, end quote. In the margin of the page near oxymoronic odds, I have written me. But many of my cross boundaries are limits imposed by the stereotypes held by my audience. To Euro-Americans as a black feminist academic, I should be in Africana studies or women's studies. I should write novels and have them published by women of color presses. If not, then I must be in sociology or education. There is an implicit assumption that my classroom is, and these are quotes from things people have said to me, highly politicized, politically correct, or Afrocentric, which in fact it is, but again, that's beside the point. <laughs> I must be a cannon basher and view education as an affirmation of my culture, and my culture does not include Eurocentric academic disciplines. Following from this same perspective, as a classicist, I must be conservative, uh, socially and politically, um, Eurocentric and male-centered. My classroom must be apolitical and unconcerned with issues of race and gender. In addition, many of my fellow African Americans view me as an odd fish. I must be one of those folks who pre prefers croissants to cornbread, one who reads Thomas Sewell. He's a black uh, conservative economist um, instead of bell hooks. Surely, I am a politically and intellectually uncritical assimilationist. Running through these assumptions is the premise that you are what you teach and that you must teach what you are. There can be no crossover, no cross boundaries. Crossovers, whether in academic disciplines or popular music or racial and ethnic categories or sexuality, are viewed with suspicion and misunderstanding. Black intellectuals have, it seems, always been judged as crossovers. The distrust and suspicion of the community, the Black community, towards Black intellectuals is not a new phenomenon. Here are the lyrics to a popular song from the very early years of the 20th century. And I have to warn you, um, there, are, there is a racial slur um, in these lyrics. Niggas getting more like white folks. 
more like white folks every day. Niggers learning Greek and Latin, niggers wearing silk and satin. Niggers getting more like white folks every day. Perhaps the most dangerous underlying assumption here is that classics as a discipline, as a discipline, is for whites only. Until relatively recently, this assumption was uncritically unchallenged by both sides of the black-white racial divide. August Wilson, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, has said, and I quote, the cultural background in my life is black and that's what I deal with. I'm not grounded in the history of Western civilization. I know names like Euripides and Aristophanes, but I haven't read all that stuff." End quote. I find such statements disturbing. The implication seems to be that if you are grounded in, in quotes, Western civilization, then you are less black, and in my case, less of a woman. In this regard, the white su supremacists have won. Even with well-intentioned initiatives such as classics is for everyone and classics is everywhere, the starting standpoint is that of the paternalistic patronizing colonizer who is willing to share out of the goodness of their white supremacist heart the bounty of classics. So why are we surprised when Black Indigenous people of color push back like August Wilson did. We must, and I believe we are more and more, um, acknowledge that classics is ideology, ideologically very conservative and has been very slow to incorporate new approaches and theories. Some of the studies in classics ca has caught on much later than any other humanities discipline. And it is now only validated if it is the same old, tired critiques and theories, adopting the same white supremacist framework as always. Borrowing from Duke Ellington, for me, these critiques, quote, don't mean, it's not going to rhyme, but that's okay. Don't, these critiques don't mean a thing, this is the quote, don't mean a thing if they ain't got race." End quote. Yeah, poor Duke Allen who was turning in his grave. Um, a good example is the emerging, or has it already emerged, a subfield of classical reception, which has come a long way from its precedent, uh, the classical tradition. The classical tradition tradition uh, dealt with the influence and impact of classical studies and classical education upon a given European-derived society. Scholars who work on the classical tradition in the U.S., for example, talk about the impact of a classical education upon the framers of the Declaration of Independence uh, and the Constitution. They write biographies of American classicists like B.L. B. L. Gildersleeve, a very strong proponent of the enslavement of African descended people, something these older scholars failed to mention. Um, the younger generation is doing much better. Um, now we have black classicism as a form of classical reception where white folks are astounded by the brilliance of black folks in race of the classics particularly in the 19th century. Men of African descent, such as Henry Highland Garnet, William Wells Brown, William Sanders Scarborough, are tokenized as exceptional by the white pioneers in black classicism. Instead of seeing these black men, black women are rarely visible in these critiques, as political actors, they are put up on a pedestal, which is nothing more than a metaphorical auction block, as proof that Black folks can succeed at classics too. Currently, there is a lot of hand-wringing that classics is being appropriated by white supremacists. 
But this is not new. We need to acknowledge that classics was forged in the crucible of white supremacy. The white supremacists are not appropriating something they built. One has only to explore how early professors uh, of classics demean uh, contemporary Greeks and Italians as, in quotes, unworthy. Currently, how easy is it to get published in classics if your area of expertise is black classicism and you are a black indigenous woman of color or a black indigenous man of color? My location as a black woman in a traditional discipline, now the marginalized of the marginalized, has led me to research how my contemporaries um, and foremothers handle the oxymoronic odds Patricia Williams described. I have been struck by how often white scholars, especially classicists who study black classicism, omit or mention only in passing women of African descent. Why, I thought, don't they discuss Fanny Jackson Coppin or Alan, Anna Julia Cooper or Mary Church Terrell or Helen Maria Chestnut? Hmm. As I asked this question of my fellow classicists, the convenient and pat reply is that Coppin, Cooper, Terrell, and Chestnut and other women of color were not professional classicists. Rather, they were educators, meaning they taught secondary school. None seem interested in the intersectional critiques offered by Black women in classics. None seem to notice the racialized sexism that kept these women I have cited out of tertiary education. No one notices that the assumption that these Black women were not intellectuals, right, that's, that's the assumption, um, reproduces and in institutionalizes the very racialized sexism which excludes us. What does set these women of African descent apart from the modern definition of a classical scholar is their social and political activism. They use their classical education as a fulcrum for social change. In this context, classics was a means to an end rather than an end itself. My exploration of my Black foremothers in classics has led me to my own evolution from a Black feminist to a critical race feminist. Consequently, I am moving away from the discovery and recovery phase to the in intersectional critiques offered by Black women in particular in classics. In addition, critical race feminist theory has opened fascinating avenues of exploring ancient societies. And one such path is the concept of racialized gender. Racialized gender provides a fruitful way of moving beyond the, con the kinds of Eurocentric assumptions embedded in perceptions of gender that arise from the in quotes, cult of true womanhood, in quote. As the scholar Eileen Boris has stated, quote, race and gender exist in tandem to transform profoundly the way that each works alone. Constructed through gendered representations, race in turn reconstructs gendered identities. The concept of racialized gender reflects this interaction." End of quote. In addition, racialized gender aids in dismantling the simplistic binary that, again, according to Boris, quote, men have race, women have gender, end quote. Now, up to now, it has been, um, feminists of color and Marxists, who may or may not also be Marxist feminists, um, 
who have applied the concept to labor movements and labor history, where the intersection of race, gender, and class has been paramount to the discussion. In my current research, I try to demonstrate how the concept can also shed light on past societies, including those of the ancient world. How does racialized gender work in our time, in our current time? Economics provides the clearest example when income disparities among black indigenous women of color and white women and white men, as well as those disparities among black indigenous men of color and white women and white men are discussed. In terms of the social milieu, the news and social media treatment of Meghan Markle and Kate Middleton throws racialized gender into stark relief. What happens when we apply racialized gender to ancient society? Well, I can tell you there are many obstacles. <laughs> but the foremost one that I have encountered is the fact that peeling away the white supremacist and anti-Black foundation of racial categories for antiquity is extremely difficult because that is the framework of the discipline and the lens through which we still interpret ancient societies. Indeed, the very resistance to using the word race to describe a social construct that existed in ancient Hellenic and Roman societies is telling. So what I want to do now, um, we're going to have a little uh, audience participation, I hope. Um, so you'll need to have a pen and paper, or if you can remember in your head, that's cool. Um, but just so you can jot things down. Um, so what I'm going to do now is share a, a case study, all right? Um, and it's, it's a case study of, first of all, how per pervasive um, white supremacist interpretations are in classics, and B, how racialized gender can, I hope, provide a way out of these interpretations and offer a more nuanced one. And you can probably guess from Elena's introduction that the star of this case study is none other than Cleopatra the Seventh. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to start by considering two quotes. Um, and here's where you might want to just jot down things. Um, if it's helpful to you, I can tell you where in my notes here I have bolded things. Um, but if you'd rather not be led by my thought process, that's fine. Um, Okay, so the, the first quote is from uh, the author Stacy Schiff. <clears throat> as recently as 2009, Stacy Schiff wrote an op-ed piece. I guess 2009 isn't recent, is it? Um, okay, so in April 2009, <laughs> Stacy Schiff wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times. It was titled, Who's buried in Cleopatra's tomb? Schiff is not a classicist, but an author of nonfiction, a former editor at Simon and Schuster, and a winner of a Pulitzer Prize for her biography of Vera uh, Nabokov, um, who was the inspiration for Lolita. She published a biography of Cleopatra in 2010. The movie rights were, were bought before it even hit the shelves. And Angelina Jolie has been cast as Cleopatra. Um, Ang Lee apparently is the director, but the project still has not seen the light of day. In, in the 2009 op-ed, Schiff sorry, wrote, and I quote, while this dig, that is the archaeological project to find Cleopatra's tomb, will resolve none of the great questions. It could, notes Professor Mary Beard, conceivably offer clues to Cleopatra's ethnicity. 
Was she pure Macedonian or all or part African? My guess is Macedonian with possibly a bit of Persian blood. Indeed, the mixed ancestry question appears to be the issue of the day. A month ago, British scientists suggested that they had discovered it, uh, sorry, had answered it definitively, producing commute, computer simulations of Cleopatra's sister based on a skull found in Turkey. End quote. Dear Stacy, <clears throat> African is not an ethnicity. Number one. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that for now, but that's okay. All right. So the next one is a rather longer, so I, this may tax your, your attention span a little bit, but I hope not because it's full of goodies. Um, all right. This is from, this is Joanne Roller author of Cleopatra a bi Biography. And it is an expert, an expert, an excerpt taken from his blog, um, posted December 6, 2010. It's title, quote, Cleopatra's true racial background, open paren, and does it really matter? Question mark, close paren, end of title. Okay. Now, I, I tend to get a little shaky because I just find this really emotionally hard to get through. So bear with me. This is Professor Roller, who is an emeritus professor of history. Uh, Ohio State University. I refuse to say the Ohio State University. Okay, quote. It has been suggested, although generally not by credible scholarly sources, that Cleopatra was racially black African. To be blunt, there is absolutely no evidence for this. Yet it is one of those issues that seems to take on a life of its own, despite all indication to the contrary. What follows lays out the evidence for Cleopatra's ancestry. But one must not forget that this is of little importance in assessing the legacy of the queen in world history. And then I, I have an ellipsis. And especially relevant in demolishing any suggestion that Cleopatra had black African blood, the representations of her in Greek and Roman art and coins do not show anything other than traditional Mediterranean ethnicity, although artists were perfectly capable of showing other ethnic groups. To sum up, it is quite possible that Cleopatra was pure Macedonian Greek, but it is probable that she had some Egyptian blood, although the amount is uncertain. Certainly it is no more than half and probably less. The best evidence is that she was three quarters Macedonian Greek and one quarter Egyptian. There is no room for anything else. Certainly not for any black African blood. Yet all this argument, argumentation is rather silly. What is important about Cleopatra is that she became one of the most powerful rulers of her era. She was a skilled linguist, a naval commander, an expert administrator, a re religious leader, who was seen by some as a Masonic figure and a worthy opponent to the Romans. She was worshiped in Egypt for over 400 years after her death. Race seems irrelevant in such a situation, and it goes without saying that people should be judged by their abilities, not their race. But sadly, even in 21st century America, this is far from the case. It is unlikely that Cleopatra cared about her racial makeup, but people over 2,000 years later still obsess about it. Thus, 
trivializing her accomplishments, end quote. I'll wait for everyone to take a deep breath. Dear me, I write, methinks Stacy, but especially Duane, doth protest too much. So what is at play here? For one thing, the language in both excerpts harkens back to the discourse of consanguinity. Consanguinity refers to a notion of kinship that uses blood as a metaphor. This can be found in antiquity. Homer uses the word blood, haima, to express kin relationships, and Herodotus enumerates blood as one of the criteria of Hellenic identity. But for Enlightenment romantics, blood symbolized the natural essence Air, quote, air quotes, natural essence of life. But it, it is this image of an essence that has led to some dangerous associations because one of the qualities of an essence is its purity. Pure, unsullied blood is blood that has been uncontaminated by another type of blood. That is blood of a different ethnic origin. Before the construct of a field of genetics, it was the image of blood as essence that lay behind the concept of racial purity and permeated so much of 19th century thought in Britain, Germany, and the United States. It led to policies such as the one drop rule. The current debate about Cleopatra's heritage has substituted ethnicity, or even worse, blood for race. Consanguinity, as we see, is still a force in Cleopatra studies, even in the 21st century. Secondly, and most importantly, is the not so subtle current of anti-blackness, especially in Roller. It is couched in the reasonableness I guess it sounds reasonable to somebody, um, of academic discourse, and as such, it becomes insidious. Here's an example of what I mean. In the U United States, there, there is a blog called Theros. It is housed at Vassar College, and it has a mission, sta uh, mission statement which outlines three purposes of the platform. One, to document appropriations of Greco-Roman culture by uh, hate groups online. I have taken this from their, their web uh, page. Um, two, to expose the errors, omissions, and distortions that underpin these groups' interpretations of ancient material. And three, to articulate a politically progressive approach. I'm going to repeat that to articulate a po politically progressive approach to the study of Greco-Roman antiquity. Now, these are all ideals I personally can get behind. All right. So imagine my consternation and anger when I found examples of anti-Blackness even here. There, but there's one example that is also a great illustration of how a theoretical standpoint of racialized gender could have thwarted the stranglehold of anti-blackness. In the November 2nd, 2018 issue, Theros had a, a takedown of an, um, I, I will give Elena the um, URL for this particular issue so you can go and read it uh, for yourself and maybe you can figure out a way to get that to people. Um, so they had a takedown of this piece um, titled Powerful Men Who Were Undone by Weakness. Right. So Ferros is critiquing this other blog post which is called Powerful Men who were undone by weakness. 
It's a misogynistic piece by Michael Sebastian, written in August 2015 for a misogynistic blog called Return of Kings. You have to laugh, right? Really, you can't make this shit up. I'm, I'm, all right. Um, Theros quotes, Theros, right, quotes the little abstract uh, from Return of Kings. Um, so Sebastian's post presents, quote, the lives of great or nearly great men who failed so that we, I don't know who the we are, but who, so that we can avoid making the same mistakes. I think he means white men, but who, who knows. Um, now, Sebastian's examples include Roman statesmen like Cicero and Mark Antony, for whom failure turns out to mean sharing power with a woman. All right, so uh, that's what Theros, that's how Theros kind of abstracts the, the piece by Sebastian. All right. From, from a gendered perspective, the Pharaoh's critique is fine. I, I don't have an issue with that. But it fails with its discussion of race. Um, so here is the Pharaoh's critique. Uh, and again, it's going to get a little confusing because they're so citing Sebastian. And if you have questions, I'll try to clarify them uh, during the, the Q&A. All right, so this is from the Pharaoh's uh, blog post. Quote, midway through his post, Sebastian includes a photograph of the Greek act actress Ada Livitsanu with the caption, so this is the caption Sebastian has given, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian, she was a Greek, like this girl. The, we're back to Theros now. The claim that Cleopatra, the claim about Cleopatra is basically true. <laughs> Although, according to one expert, the best evidence is that she was three quarters Macedonian Greek and one quarter Egyptian. But what we're still at Pharos, right? But whatever her background, the remark may initially seem out of place in an article that otherwise uh, attributes no significance to race or nationality. Its relevance is that more is at stake for Sebastian than a simple correction of persistent and unhistorical claims that Cleopatra was black a fav favorite hobby horse of hate groups. The choice of the blonde haired and green eyed Livet Sanu, an actress who has never played Cleopatra and whose best known role as a man who is transformed into a woman, makes her an odd choice for a transphobic site gestures toward a white supremacist claim of racial continuity between ancient blonde-haired Nordic invaders and modern Europeans." End of quote. <clears throat> okay. I had, I had a visceral reaction to several points in this blog post. And so I'm curious to see if you had the same. And I know this is hard to do, but uh, maybe I'll tell you what mine were and you can put a thumbs up or whatever. The, the first one, the claim about Cleopatra is basically true. Really? Okay. All I can say is consanguinity. How is the claim basically true? Why do we cite genealogy as evidence of Cleopatra's Greekness when she identified through place of birth, actions, religion, and language as Egyptian? Number two, 
persistent and historical claims that Cleopatra was black. What is this if not an illustration of anti-blackness? What source does Pharos cite for this? Um, they have two citations. One, Dwayne Roller's blog post, which we just learned about. And two, a June 2010 essay about Angelina Jolie being cast at Cleopatra in essence a magazine published by Essence Communications, which is described as, quote, the number one media technology and co commerce company dedicated to black women and inspires a global audience of more than 20 million through diverse uh, storytelling and immersive original content. From the pages of its signature magazine, Essence occupies a special place in the hearts of Black women everywhere, whether bringing news, politics, culture, entertainment, or inspiration for her aspirations, Essence is committed to telling her stories in her voice and in her image, and has become a most trusted confident, confidant and home for global Black culture. That's a quote taken from Essence Communications about page. Okay, so that's their source for the persistent and unhistorical claims that Cleopatra was black. Okay. Furthermore, Sharia Carroll, the author of the Essence piece, is hardly a historical when she states, quote, while historically there is no concrete confirmation that Cleopatra was of a darker complexion, there is more evidence than not that she was black with a capital B and not entirely, not entirely of Macedonian Greek ancestry as Shakespeare, leagues of painters and now Hollywood would have us believe. All right, end of that. Uh, by applying the concept of racialized gender instead of misogyny, misogynoir, misogynoir, dog whistles, Pharos could have done a more incisive analysis of Sebastian's racialized sexism and thwarted the intrusion of anti-blackness. Racialized gender, when applied to the ancient world, urges us to expand the parameters of what we mean by race and by gender. Cleopatra herself has told us who she was, an Egyptian pharaoh. And queen gets me every time, but that's another That's also part of it, right? When we describe her uh, with modern terms like black with a lowercase b, or Greek, read white, or queen, um, which implies there has to be a king, um, we are not doing the work of dismantling white supremacy and decolonizing our interpretations of her. So I'm coming to the end. Somehow I have to negotiate my way through this morass of assumptions and my own convictions. For example, in my courses, we do discuss race, white supremacy, and gender. Together, my students and I interrogate the history of classical scholarship and how the discipline developed in the context of deep racism, anti-Semitism, and misogyny. The societies who lang whose languages we learn and read and whose cultures we study, I'm careful to avoid the term civilization, were themselves rigidly patriarchal and xenophobic. Students have reacted with hostility but only when they have expected to find in courses on antiquity a safe haven from such issues. From such issues, I incorporate Black feminist thought and literary criticism and the work of Black women into my own research and coursework. So I do politicize my classroom, 
I am angered by traditional classicists and students who assume that classics or the canon is not political, or who disparage my attempts to confront issues of sexism and anti-blackness in the discipline. Until very recently, there has been no awareness or appreciation of the standpoints uh, that women of color or men of color can bring to classics, but I believe that is changing. Um, the assumptions and attitudes I have experienced are not incidences peculiar to classics. Black indigenous women of color in the academy today often express our anger at the assumptions and attitudes held about us. But the anger is directed not only at these attitudes and assumptions, but also at the erasure of the multiplicity of our lives and experience. I have come to realize that I, like other Black Indigenous women of color, speak in tongues, to borrow May Gwendolyn Henderson's words. As she states, multiplicity of discourses and plurality of choices are the core of, of Black women's re resilience. I can't talk anymore. Resilience. So yes. I am a black slash critical race feminist classicist, and I will stop calling myself an oxymoron and instead aim for, again in the words of Henderson, quote, a unity of understanding within the dialectics of my identity. Thank you, and I can't wait for your question. Yay! <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Professor Haley. Uh, this, that was a very insightful talk. Um, so yeah, we'll now open the floor to questions. Um, but before I give space to the audience, I would like to ask um, one of the questions that was submitted in advance by our Vice President, uh, James Hua. Um, he says, uh, I have a question about recruiting classical myths and episodes from a perspective that is more aware of the racism of our field. Recent adaptations of certain myths have reinterpreted and brought out the feminist aspect of the myth, like countless examples of the Medusa myth uh, or uh, of Pat, Pat Barker's The Silence of the Girls uh, across different media. Uh, there, have there been similar similar reinterpretations mm -hmm. uh, through the lens of racism and underrepresented BAME perspectives. And what aspects do you think could be emphasized and could this be a way to make racism in classics more clear to a wider audience? Who? Um, I, I, I know of the one attempt I, I think it was done by the BBC, was it, about, uh, about Troy, where they cast a black actor as Achilles. Do I have that right? Um, and the absolute backlash against that was really quite funny. I mean, it wasn't very good, but, yeah, but that's beside the point, right? But the, the um, yeah. I, I, I think people seem to be emotionally invested in this idea that um, particularly Greek mythology is somehow, it, it, it's, it, it's been whitened to the point that that seems to be the norm when I'm not really I'm not really sure that it is. I mean, I think, I think the way to do it, um, and I think Kate's still here. Um, she can attest to this. When I taught, I was teaching the Aeneid, and we were doing the later bo books of the Aeneid, and, and one of the projects that I had them do was they had to do casting for a film, I believe a book 10, if I'm remembering right, Kate can correct me. Um, but, because I pointed out that there's never been a film made of the Indian, and when he needed to make a great film. And, and so, so um, the assignment was to come up with casting explanations and then 
lines drawn from the book to substantiate your, your choice. And the students, it was the students who came back and said, can we do gender and race blind casting? And I said, absolutely. And, and, and the results were absolutely amazing. Um, as Kate will attest, I don't know if Kate wants to weigh in. Um, but so I think it it's gonna take um, younger folks, right, who have been trained under a different, I hope, a different, more inclusive rubric to start to whittle away at, at, at that. But that's, it's a great question and it, it should happen. Um, it, it's, I have found that it's always somewhat easier to, to, to approach the gender aspect um, because, um, just because you know whiteness has such a, a huge hold on, on on the discipline that it's a lot easier to say oh you know we can do a feminist retelling of antigone or penelope or whoever the one place where it falls down i find it interesting or where i've encountered a lot of resistance is i have another case study with racialized gender that I've worked up with Medea. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and that's been interesting. Yeah. The, the, the pushback that, well, yeah, but she, yes, yeah, she was foreigner, but she was still mm, of the same sort of racial background. And if you've read Herodotus, you know that's not true. Uh, just, yeah, I don't know that I answered. I don't know if that answered your question. Kate, did you want to say something? Yeah, I really enjoyed that project. I feel like it really um, shaped a lot of our views of who Aeneas wa like was, who Dido could be, who Turnus could be, um, and I think it was a really powerful exercise in looking at what like classical reception can be as well. Um, so it was a, that was a really great project. Yes. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Kate, but that's <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't know, James, if that answered your question, but yeah. Thank you. There have been some uh, interesting uh, comments in the chat. Um, Vanessa Stavo uh, has said, Sir uh, Neale Austin. Tony Morrison, Gwendolyn Brooks, Rita Dove, and Alice Walker have all given racialized feminist versions of Persephone. Um, then uh, Derek Haddad said, I saw a powerful performance in uh, New York City of Prometheus Bound, where Prometheus mm -hmm. was played by a black actor at the Olympians, and the Olympians were white. It added a poignant aspect um, to the play. Right. And what I, I'm speaking of Prometheus Baum, what I always find really interesting is how people read past the um, the genealogy of Heracles in that play, and that that um, be, because I mean. Uh, um, Aeschylus is very clear, right, that, that as a descendant of Ephesus, Heracles has dark skin. I mean, he, he, he doesn't pussyfoot around it. It's, it's right there in the, in the text. But the number of classicists who just sort of, well, that, let's talk about poor Io and how she's being tortured by the, right? It's just, I just find it fascinating. In Toni Morrison's words, um, how the Africanity gets, gets um, um, passed over, right? Uh, it, it, it doesn't get uh, expressed. Yeah. I should probably look at the chat too and see if I can see questions. But yeah. Um, So 
someone Ashley asked um, what kind of institutional changes or shifts in the discipline do we need in order to avoid current undergraduates and postgraduates having to push against the same resistance? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard because it breaks my heart when I hear when I hear from young um, uh, well undergrads or or even grad students and and you know young assistant professors and um, I don't know how many of you know what's been going on at Princeton um, but it's just it's really I think we need a big giant eraser and we're going to do a do-over right? just do a complete do-over um, about how this discipline Know, came to the forefront. I mean, I think it's important to remember that it came, right? Classics came into um, being as a counter to biblical studies, right? So if you look at the history of the discipline or, or the classical tradition, the intellectual authority before the Enlightenment, let's say, was the Bible, right? And so everyone looked to the Bible for, for even intellectual answers to things. And then this discipline was formed, and I'm not an expert at this, so you know I may be pulling things out of my you-know-where, but it just seems to me that this was a way for men to take a positivist, rational look at at knowledge and and uh, epistemology, and exclude everybody else. Um, so, um, right. Uh, let's see. Can I say a quick Lucia? question? Sure. Sure. I get to see you again. Um, Hi, Suzanne. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more I, uh, for everybody else. I'm from UNC Chapel Hill in the United States. And I wanted to ask, um, Shelley, a little bit more. Can you talk a little bit more about racialized gender and how you can apply that? Because, you know, in the example you used of Cleopatra, it just, it seems like there are just so many, like people don't know what they don't know, right? So it just seems like right. there's so many pitfalls you can get into because we haven't had enough examples of how to use the words and the ideas in a thoughtful way continuously, you know? So right. you're, right. so you can only sort of zone in on one little part, but right. then you kind of miss, there's a blind spot here and it's hard to address all those things without lots of footnotes, I guess, you know? So how, like, is there sort of a simple, like, or, not it doesn't have to be simple but is there a way <laughs> i don't think it's simple but is there I, give an example again of how to you know apply that idea that you talk right about? so um the media let's let's we'll, we'll stick with media because i think now okay so the way media has always been interpreted based on the play by Euripides is that uh, she is a foreign woman brought to Corinth by her civilizing husband, right? But you can take the girl out of, or the woman, out of the um barbarian country but you can never take the barbarian out of the woman but that, that, that kind of that seems to be the sort of standard way of of looking at medea and, and medea just sort of it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because she ends up killing her kids and who does that right um so what racialized gender at least the way i apply it asks us to do is to look at 
what's going on with Medea, for sure, absolutely. Let's look at her family tree. Her family tree, she is the aunt, her aunt is Circe, she's granddaughter of Helios, she uh, lives on Colchis, which according to Herodotus was um, colonized by the uh, dark-skinned, um, tightly curled, haired um, remnants of Sistostris' army, um, clearly pointing to some uh, folks of African descent. Um, as the granddaughter of the of the sun, uh, she's a child of the sun, and that's a very old moniker that folks of African descent have applied to themselves. All right, so if if we take that kind of broad um, look, and and I interpret for the ancient world, I interpret the word race very broadly. So um, if you are not indigenous, right, if you cannot, even if you are indigenous to a particular, let's say Athens or Attica, well, that's your race, right? Um, I try really, really, really hard to stay away from the word Greek because it's a misnomer and to talk about unhistorical. There was no Greece, right? You had Athens, you had Sparta, you had Thrace, you had, right? Right, okay. Um, so, so um, what happens when this character with this racialized gender meets another character with a different racialized gender? Jason also has racialized gender. He's not sort of the norm, right? Um, and so if we interpret Medea as the, the, the voice or the, the lens through which we're uh, looking at um, a kind of intercultural interaction, then we get away from this, oh, she's a horrible person. She killed her children, right? And all these things are based on this, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world nonsense, which has nothing to do with Medea or Jason. I don't know if that helps. A, a, another, another example, kind of not as well known, but um, that's Sophoniba. Sophoniba, who was the Carthaginian uh, woman who was engaged to one ruler in Numidia, I believe it was East, Eastern Numidia, um, and then engaged or actually married to him. And then when the Romans, the colonizers came in and everybody was getting all upset. And, and so the the capital in eastern Numidia fell and Sophoniba then should have been the trophy of the Romans but another uh, Numidian Massinissa from western Numidia comes in and he's an ally with the Romans she sees her deliverance in this fellow Numidian right and so or I, I should say fellow um, native of an African nation I'm trying hard not to use African as a as a nationality because it really drives me nuts um, so um, she anyway she persuades him Massinissa to marry her rather than have her fall into the hands of the Romans it's reminiscent of Cleopatra, right? So, because Livy is the one who's writing about it, there's so many layers you have to fight through. But, so it then becomes clear when Scipio is berating Massinissa for marrying Sophoniba, you get this 
again, it's the clash between, oh, she's dark skinned woman who has seduced you. You don't know what you're doing, right? And, and so that, racializ that racializes her gender. Does that kind of help? Your article, Suzanne, was a huge help to me because I don't know whether you knew it or not, <laughs> but you had a lot of really good examples of racialized gender um, in, in your article about the Heliodorus. And, and, and so, um, yeah, the, the, that, Heliodorus is another one. I think the, the, the ICO Pika is like full of examples of, of racialized gender. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that term racialized gender is so, you know, because you could also say gendered race as well, you know, it's, but I think, you, you, you know, could. I think um, for those who yeah. haven't, what I said in the article was just that both of these things, gender and race, work on a spectrum and they kind of cross each other at various points on the, on the sliding okay. scale. Right. And right. each moment they change. Mm -hmm. And so, um, based on who's around you, so that's right. That's right. I mean, in, in in both, I would say racialized gender is a is 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 a dynamic that is just as performative as race or gender. It's but it's in that combination that the performance happens. And sometimes it's not even necessarily performative, it's how you are viewed, so, right? So, for example, um, just myself, I've been embroiled in a, in a rather nasty situation at, at my college where um, I was left off, even though I have taught at Hamilton for 31 years, I was left off the, the president's uh, racial uh, advisory council on whatever diversity and inclusion um, and um, why who knows um, but I, I, I was talking to a former student who is close to various people um, in the alumni office and he said well Professor Haley the truth of the matter is the president wanted people who play well together in the sandbox. Um, and you don't. What? What? Why? Why? Well, because I speak my mind. Right? So, why? And so it's, I have been, right? A victim of, it, it, I don't want to say victim, but that to me that's another illustration of racialized genders. Okay, so you want someone who in your mind isn't outspoken, isn't going to rock the boat, isn't going to, yeah. So. Uh, professor, can I ask a question? Sure. Awesome. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm, I'm Kelly and I teach uh, Greek and Latin at the K through 12 level. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was so enlightening. Um, and I guess that's one good thing about all this coronavirus stuff is that we're doing more online uh, gatherings like this. So thank you for um, sharing with us. So very early on in your talk, you said something that struck me which is that um, your peers derided you for learning languages of dead white people. Um, so as a Greek American, I'm interested in that, you know, even if you look at modern Greece, um, when they were joining the EU, there was a debate, you know, are we Eastern or are we Western? Mm -hmm. And then during the, um, the financial crisis, you know, you had many Europeans, like a former French president said that Greece is more Oriental than European, and of course, thinking about ancient Greece, you know, its ties, its cultural ties were far more with, um, you know, the Levant, um, North Africa, places like that. But we do these days think of Greeks and Romans as, I guess, white, right? Like if you look at drawings and books, 
you know, they're blonde and pale. And of course, in movies, like you talked about, they're always played by yes, Western Europeans. So I personally try to, you know, push back against that in my classes. But I guess I was wondering what your viewpoint is on, you know, the the purported whiteness, the constructed whiteness of um, ancient Greece and Rome. Um, well, I try very hard um, not to use any modern racial categories when I talk about the ancient world. Um, so um, I, you know, I, I have been, uh, people have misinterpreted my position on Cleopatra. Um, I, I believe that Cleopatra was black with a capital B, um, which means in terms of her political and cultural position, she was um, capital B black. Um, in her race, in my mind, is Egyptian. That's how I look at the ancient world. So with, it gets particularly um, tricky with, I think, Hellenic societies because they were a series of city-states. And so you have, you have very, it's a very different ethnic group in Sparta as opposed to Athens. The, the, there are two different ethnic groups, right? Um, and and even if you want, they're, they're two different linguistic groups as well, right? So I try really hard not to categorize ancient societies as black and white. I think the difficulty both with, with Rome slash Italy and Greece is that they, they are from the Southern Mediterranean and their proximity to Africa makes them, and I'm using quotes, guilty by association. And so I have found a lot of resistance among Greek Americans to any sort of idea that they could possibly be indebted in any way to Egypt or, or anywhere else. Sure, because there is definitely a, an investment by, by modern Greeks of their, you know, belonging to the European community, right? They do that for, you know, political reasons. Sure, sure, uh, yeah. sure. sure. Um, and and which, which, I, which I totally get, right? Um, but it, there still is an element of anti-blackness and white supremacy there, right? I mean, it, it's true of the Dominican Republic, for heaven's sake. Right, so um, it's it's a really very insidious kind of of thing that 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 goes on there. Um, but I, so I think you know I think the best way to change this um, is really to teach by example and and to say you know be careful um, the language that you use around right. Um, like I said, I try. It, it, it gets cumbersome. It really does. Um, um, but you know, I I will delineate delineate all the different um, city states on the Hellenic Peninsula rather than say Greek. It, it just yeah. for 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 the ancient world. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, thank Did that you. Did I answer your question? Or? Well, I guess I just, I think there are two issues. There's the ethnicities of the ancient world, and then there is how moderns view the ethnicities of the ancient world. And I yeah. think, you know, if we're going to talk about appropriation, there's a huge appropriation by Western Europeans of the ancient Greek and Roman culture, right? Absolutely, and so, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yes, that's okay. right. Right. All right. I totally, totally agree. Totally okay. agree. And thank I, you so much. I don't know. I, I don't know if I have an answer, except to, you know, constantly point out that, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Professor. Yeah.
Uh, we have uh, a question on the chat. Uh, Elizabeth Koch uh, asks, I have a slightly different question. Uh, has there been a sociological study on how people externalize their identity into classical myths? Um, not only, but including white supremacists, maybe. Uh, being online too much, I realized that this externalization seems to be a thing among my peer group uh, that is uh, interested in ancient stuff. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I, um, so I'm not sure what Elizabeth means by externalize their identity. Can you give me an example, Elizabeth? Does anybody else have an idea of what she might mean? Yeah. I think I have an idea of what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I actually am guilty of that. For example, when I think of the classics or like Plato and Aristotle, I think of them looking more like me than like my wider peers because okay. they're the Southern Mediterranean. So like right, they right. probably have browner skin. Yeah. I think that's probably fair. <laughs> I mean, I think that's probably right. Yeah. Um, Classical myths. Uh, I actually have an example. Um, okay. A really older one is Zora Neale Hurston when she was at Barnard College. Um, she was reading and performing uh, one of Ovid's versions of Ceres and Proserpina um, in the hopes of sort of like embodying her own Proserpina or Persephone to gain her own sort of like white female patronage, and she did, actually. That's how she got uh, two of her biggest well, benefactrixes. Yeah. That's one yeah. example. I, I'll tell you what got me interested in classics, um, I mean, even before, you know, I was introduced to Latin, was my, my uh, father worked at then Hampton in Institute, it's now Hampton University, uh, which is an, another historically black um, university. And, and um, my brother, my younger brother, was cast as one of the children in County Cullen's Medea. Um, so that's a really interesting, if you've never read it, it's a really interesting reception of the myth of Medea. Um, and on the surface, it's seems very sort of uh, straightforward. There's no real deviating from the story. Um, but, but the fact that it was a man of African descent who wrote the script and it just, it, it's an interesting, I guess that's a good example, um, externalization of his um, his identity because it, it becomes against the it's almost a statement about colonization um and so it's a interesting piece yeah there's a question about emotional labor can we make that the last one or or yeah i know sure. you said you wanted to end at three okay um so Professor Haley, do you have any suggestions for how to deal with the emotional lab, uh, labor uh, BAME classes undertake and the resulting burnout from constantly challenging white academics' assumptions often on their behalf, especially when these assumptions seem to underpin the structure of classes as a discipline? Um, um, This might sound really new agey, but I would just surround yourself with the good energy of your people. Um, really, that honestly, that's how I, I have survived. I mean, you will notice from the introduction that I have a joint position with Africana Studies. Uh, <clears throat> 
I had for my own sanity, I had to limit. Um, I will always love Latin and Greek. Um, classics, however, uh, right? Um, and so I, for my, for really the preservation of my own mental health, I had to move into a field where I could offer courses um, that um, spoke to uh, really a, a, a broader audience. Um, and so I, I think that is the best way because the, the, the biggest danger is the burnout. Um, and, and we need you all in the field. So that, that would be my answer. Thank you, Chloe, for that question. All right. I'm sorry we didn't get okay. to all of them, but I'll, I'm going to go through and read them. And um, is there any that most of these are just suggestions? Um, um, yeah. Cool. Great. It's so great to see everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank, well, thank you. you, Professor Haley, for accepting the invitation. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. This was the <laughs> most attended talk <laughs> in the classic <laughs> society ever. So. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. And also, thank you for the classic society, and in particular, our Vice President, James Swa, for his con constant support. Uh, and most importantly, well, good, 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 good luck with your results. Thank you very much. <laughs> good luck. I, I will be thinking about you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. It's been a really stimulating right. discussion. Thanks. Well, we look forward to future <laughs> meetings. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.